And so without further ado, I want to begin by introducing our first speaker for the session. And we will, as I mentioned, move from a global level to a more individual level as we go through each of our speakers, each of whom have uh, incredible accomplishments to their own rights. So Ira Helfand, or should I say at Ira Helfand, um, he is the international co-president of International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, the organization that was a recipient of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, he had the best excuse ever in my mind for not being there when they received the Nobel Peace Prize. He just had mentioned that he was changing diapers at the time, which I think is certainly a good, a good and justifiable uh, reason. He, um, he has uh, tremendous uh, academic accomplishments, publishing in the New England Journal of Medicine, BMJ, and having lectured in many countries around the world. He's represented PSR, the American counterpart, and IPPNW at the Nobel ceremony in December 2009 when President Obama received his Nobel Peace Prize. And um, he himself actually works as a, an internist and urgent care physician at Family Care Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, where he uh, lives right nearby, I guess, in Leeds, Massachusetts, with his wife, Deborah, a uh, medical oncologist. And so Ira will begin the session speaking a little bit about the very real uh, concerns we need to have about nuclear war and the, the imminent necessity to abolish nuclear weapons. Ira, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so it is late in the day and people are tired and I'm going to talk about the end of the world. Um, <laughs> so f forgive me, I'll try to make it as exciting as possible. Um, a generation ago when uh, IVPNW and PGS were getting started, there was a very, very widespread understanding around the world of the enormous danger that nuclear weapons posed. And as a result of this, millions of people were involved across the planet in a movement to prevent nuclear war and ultimately to abolish nuclear weapons. And this movement was astonishingly successful in ways which we didn't really fully even understand at the time. Uh, we changed the thinking of the major leaders of the Soviet Union and the United States, ended the Cold War arms race, saved the planet, but didn't get rid of the nuclear weapons. They didn't go away. A lot of them were taken apart, but about 15,000 of them remain on the planet. And what we have now entered is a period where the danger of nuclear war is growing greater. And so it is particularly important that we understand what these weapons will do today, what is the danger that we still face. I want to start uh, by discussing um, limited nuclear war. Do you know where? I'm, I'm pressing the green button, nothing's happening. Just hit the red button. The red button's supposed to go back? Okay, well. Next slide, please. Here we go. Uh, I was asked to identify my conflicts of interest. Um, in a strict sense, I have none. I suppose uh, we, we all have an interest in preventing nuclear war, but I guess that doesn't really count for these purposes. Um, so I want to talk to you about... Um, Next slide, the clicker is not clicking. Good, okay, okay. thank you. Um, I want to start first by talking about limited nuclear war. In the Cold War era, we talked and focused primarily our, our attention on war between the United States and the Soviet Union, and this is a, was an important consideration. But in recent years, we have come to understand that even a much more limited war uh, would have consequences across the entire planet. And the scenario that we focused on is a war between India and Pakistan, uh, in which each side uses about 50 relatively small nuclear weapons. By small, I mean about the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. And obviously, this is not small in, in an absolute sense, but by comparison to the weapons which do exist in arsenals today, it is very small. So we're talking about a very limited use of these weapons. 50 India, 50 Pakistan, about a half of their current arsenals, about a half of 1% of the world's current arsenals. The consequences of this would be absolutely catastrophic in South Asia. In the first week, something like 20 to 35 million people would die from the explosions, from the fires, from the radiation. And to put that in context, during all of World War II, over the course of about eight years, about 50 million people died. So an event comparable in magnitude, but taking place in the course of a single week. But as horrendous as these 
uh, consequences in South Asia are, they're only a very small part of the story. Because the problem is, if you blow up 100 cities with Hiroshima-sized bombs, the fires started by these explosions put about anywhere from five to six and a half million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. And this soot blocks out the sun, drops temperatures across the planet, shortens growing season, and produces a catastrophic decline in food production. Uh, we've studied this uh, in regards primarily to uh, the United States and China. This slide shows the, the effects on China, which is the world's largest producer of food. Um, for corn, maize, uh, in the first five years, it's a 17% decline in the crop, and over a full decade, it's about 16%. For middle season rice, the largest food crop in China, the decade-long decline is about 17%. And for winter wheat, which is the second largest food crop in China, the production goes down about 31%. Um, the world just is not in a position to absorb declines in food production of this magnitude. At the current moment, world grain reserves amount to about 80 days of consumption. And so all the granaries, there's enough food staved up to feed the planet for less than three months. And that is not going to be anywhere as near an adequate buffer for famine that lasts for a decade or more. In addition, at baseline today, there are about 795 million people who are already malnourished. They're getting on average about 1,800 calories a day, which is just enough for an average adult to maintain his or her body mass and do a little bit of physical work, you know, to gather food or to grow food. Uh, this entire group of people is at risk. They cannot sustain a significant further decline in their food production. In addition, there are about 300 million people who are getting pretty good nutrition today, but live in countries where most of the food or much of the food is imported. And that includes a number of very wealthy countries like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, most of the countries in the Middle East, most of the countries in North Africa. So that's another 300 million people. And finally, there are about a billion people in China who are getting adequate nutrition today, live in a country where most of the food is grown in country, but who have not shared in the significant economic progress that's taken place in China over the last 30 years. And this group of people also would be extremely vulnerable in the event of the huge declines in food production that we're now projecting for China, which would lead to uh, enormous rises in food prices and food becoming inaccessible for people who do not have significant amounts of money. And there are uh, about a billion people in China who, may, who live on less than $5 a day. So all told, uh, we believe that a limited nuclear war in South Asia, just involving a tiny percent of the world's nuclear weapons and confined to one geographic area, would cause a global nuclear famine lasting for over a decade that could put at risk up to two billion people, a third of the human race. This would be an event unprecedented in human history. There has never been anything like this. It does not would not mean the biological extinction of our species, but it would almost certainly mean the end of modern civilization. No civilization in history has ever withstood a shock of this magnitude, and there's no reason to think that ours would be any different. We use the example of India and Pakistan. Um, the same scenario could also be produced by the weapons on board a single U.S. Trident submarine. These Tridents carry 96 warheads, not 100, but 96 but each of them is 10 to 30 times more powerful than the weapons that we used in the South Asia scenario. And that's just, you know, the US has 14 of these submarines, and that's only a third of its nuclear arsenal because there are bombers and land-based missiles. And the Russians have an arsenal which has the same, literally insane level of overkill capacity. So I think we, we ought to look at what would happen if these arsenals were used as well. And I wanna start by describing a large-scale attack on a city. I'm gonna use New York, I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to prepare uh, slides using Toronto as the victim, but uh, that's probably just as well. Um, we're, we're familiar with the images of Hiroshima, a um, city just flattened by a 15 kiloton bomb. A modern attack would not involve a single bomb. Uh, it would involve, in a case of New York, maybe 10, 15, 20 bombs, and each of them would be 30 to 50 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. It's a little bit difficult for me to describe and for you to absorb a, a, the a description of, of 15 bombs going off all at once. So I'm gonna use a model of a single 20 megaton bomb. <coughs> the model overestimates the megatonnage, the, the total amount of explosive force that would be generated. It actually underestimates the destruction that would take place because you destroy a city more efficiently 
if you have multiple small explosions spread out over a large area, which is why that's the way uh, modern uh, arsenals are designed. But the, single mo the sing model of a single explosion, I think, gives an adequate understanding of, of the danger that we're facing. Within a thousandth of a second of the detonation of this bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out but three kilometers in every direction, six kilometers across. Within this entire area, the temperature rises to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun, and everything is vaporized. The buildings, the people, the trees, the upper level of the earth itself disappears. To a distance of six kilometers in every direction, the explosion generates winds in excess of 1,000 kilometers per hour and blast pressures greater than 25 pounds per square inch. Mechanical forces of this magnitude destroy anything that people can build. Underground shelters collapse when they're exposed to forces of this magnitude. To a distance of nine kilometers in every direction, uh, the heat is so intense that automobiles will melt. To a distance of 15 kilometers in every direction, and notice I've had to change the scale of the map to accommodate this expanding circle of destruction. To 15 kilometers in every direction, the winds are still greater than 300 kilometers per hour. And forces of that magnitude will level uh, wood frame buildings, masonry buildings. A modern building like this would see the walls and, and, the, and the floors swept out, and a steel skeleton would be left standing. That's all. To a distance of 25 kilometers in every direction. The heat would still be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Cloth, wood, paper, gasoline, heating oil, plastic, it all ignites. Hundreds of thousands of fires which over the next half hour coalesce into a firestorm, 50 kilometers across, covering nearly 2,000 square kilometers Within this entire area, the temperature rises to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, 800 degrees centigrade. All of the oxygen is consumed, and every living thing dies. The bacteria and the viruses die. The area is sterilized of life. In the case of New York City, we're talking about 15 million people dead in a half an hour. And if this were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this same level of destruction would be visited on every major city in both countries. And if NATO were drawn into the conflict, every major city in Canada and, and Europe as well. And a report that we did in 2002 showed that if only 300 of the 7,000 warheads in the Russian arsenal detonated over urban targets in the United States, 75 to 100 million people would be dead uh, in the first half hour. And in addition, the entire economic infrastructure of the country, everything that we depend on to keep our populations alive would be gone. The, the public health system, the internet, the electric grid, the food distribution system, none of this would exist anymore. And over the months following this attack, the vast majority of the people surviving in the US, in Canada, in Russia, in Europe, would also die from starvation, from exposure the following winter, from epidemic disease, from radiation poisoning, probably close to a billion people as a result of the direct effects. Um, but as incredible as this is, um, again, these direct effects are only a small part of the picture. Uh, little war in South Asia puts six million tons of soot into the atmosphere. A war between the United States and Russia with just the forces they have on high alert puts about uh, 150 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. And that drops temperatures across the planet about eight degrees centigrade. In the interior of North America, the temperatures go down about 20 to five to 30 degrees centigrade. For three years, there's not a single day free of frost. And that means the ecosystems that have evolved since the last ice age collapse, food production stops, the vast majority of the human race starves, and in fact, we may become extinct as a species. Now, this is not just some horrible nightmare scenario I've cooked up. Um, this is a real and present danger. India and Pakistan, there's fighting every day on the line of demarcation in Kashmir. They have gone to war four times. They have come close to war two additional times uh, in the last 10 years. 
Uh, there are many flashpoints that could lead to fighting between the two of them. And if fighting occurs, it is almost certainly going to turn nuclear. Between the United States and Russia, you know, we were told for 25 years we didn't have to worry about that. But we do. The war in Ukraine, the war in Syria have shown that the U.S. and Russia could easily end up on opposite sides of a shooting war. And if that happens, both sides have been engaging in the most irresponsible nuclear saber rattling over the last year and a half. There's every real possibility that this would result in nuclear war between the two. And even if there wasn't a deliberate decision to use nuclear weapons, there's always the possibility that there would be an accidental war. We know of at least five occasions in the last 35 years when either Moscow or Washington prepared to launch nuclear war in the mistaken belief that it itself was already under attack by the other side. The most recent of these was in 1995, well after the end of the Cold War. And as a final uh, element of danger, we are now told by military leaders that uh, terrorists could trigger a nuclear war with a cyber attack in which they hack into com command and control systems and actually launch US or Russian missiles against the other side. So we are living in an incredibly dangerous moment. It is as bad as it was in the 80s, and the problem is that for the most part, people aren't paying attention to this. But in the last few years, there have been some really important uh, rays of light. Um, there are a series of international conferences, uh, unprecedented. They started in 2014, in which governments came together to discuss the medical consequences of nuclear war. Uh, this hadn't happened in the first 68 years of the nuclear weapons era. But now countries, mainly non-nuclear weapon states, are frightened, and they're taking action. And as a result of these conferences, um, there has been f created uh, a new movement to ban nuclear weapons, essentially. Uh, at the level of civil society, this is being led by a, uh, an organization called ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, started by IPPNW, now involving about 500 uh, NGO organizations in 94 countries, led uh, very importantly, I think, by young people, primarily, uh, headquartered in Geneva, but with campaigners all around the world. Uh, and this uh, NGO umbrella group has been working in cooperation with a number of governments who are determined to make the nuclear weapon states live up to their obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and get rid of their nuclear arsenals. And the way they're doing it is uh, through a process which will bring a resolution to the UN this fall calling for the establishment of a conference next year to negotiate a new treaty based on, modeled on the Ottawa uh, Landmine Convention, a new treaty that prohibits the possession of nuclear weapons and demands that the nuclear weapon states honor that uh, new legal prohibition and negotiate the abolition of their arsenals. Um, there is an enormous responsibility on our shoulders. Many people in this room have been working on nuclear weapons issues for decades. Others, for others, I think this may be a completely new issue. We're all doing all kinds of important things in our daily life. We have to figure out how to commit some time and some energy to this issue. If we do not get rid of nuclear weapons, and the time frame for this, I think, is incredibly short, they are going to be used. And all the things that I described are going to happen. This is not the future that must be, but it is the future that will be if we don't take action. No one of us is expected to do this job all by ourselves, But each one of us has to take on that part of the job, which is ours to do. The choice between us is very stark. The nuclear weapon states are planning to spend trillions of dollars, literally, over the next 30 years modernizing their nuclear arsenals and maintaining them for decades to come. The non-nuclear weapon states are saying we need to get rid of them all and seek the security of a world free of nuclear weapons. And we know that their path is right and that if we follow the path of the nuclear weapon states, it's going to end in disaster. We have a choice, life or death. It's up to us. And we need to choose wisely and we need to act with courage and determination so that indeed we choose life. Thank you very much.